Hey, welcome to another episode of Footnotes. Today we're on location at Bourbon Lounge here in Columbia and we're talking to Christian Nimi. He's a restaurateur and maybe even a reluctant entrepreneur. We talk about all kinds of things from the state of hospitality in Columbia to what it's like to run um, multiple businesses uh, in hospitality. And he even becomes a bit of a life coach at the end. I hope you watch this all the way through because Christian had a lot of great things to say. He's got a ton of experience that I think can help a lot of people. All this is next on Footnotes. So we're here with Christian Nimi, uh, one of Columbia's uh, great restaurateurs and, and also probably entrepreneurs in, term, in terms of food. Uh, thanks for letting tough us word. sit down. We're here in Bourbon <laughs> Lounge. And, um, you know, when we were talking before this and kind of setting this up, you know, you were like, "Hey, John, don't don't go through all the bio and all that because you can Google. People can Google your name. They can they can go to websites." I've been around a while, yeah. So, I mean, if we can just go into the main course, so to sure, speak. yeah, um, I'd love that. That's refreshing. And I'll um I'll drop a couple of bad restaurant uh, food puns in there. Please also, don't please don't do. worry about that. <laughs> uh, I got that covered. Um, but so we're here at, at the Bourbon Lounge, and what comes first? Do you find a great location? Or do you have a concept rolling around in your mind and you want to do that and you're not focused on location? Like, how do you begin to bring these things about? I, I wish I could say that there was a that there was a science to it, that, that I would think about it that deeply. I do have a lot of concepts. I've got notebooks filled with concept ideas. Um, they'll start off as, a, as just a header on a page and, and then I'll slowly kind of flesh them out, add ideas, cross out, you know, as I travel around and go to other restaurants and not even other restaurants, everything, retail, uh, you name it, you, you pick up little ideas here that here and there. So, no, it doesn't, it, there's no like super concise process to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, bourbon was completely different than black rooster was completely different than gervais and vine was com- i mean each one had a genesis that was slightly different although they all kind of come back to that i kind of do have an idea of what i want and i have a passion as to to pursue it and the space that i find will usually help decide which one it's going to be a little bit more than anything else. So so here, say, let's take bourbon, for example. This was not an idea, was never an idea to do bourbon. This really was, this came from the building itself. So okay. back in 2013, uh, First Citizens decided that they were going to renovate the building using uh, historic tax credits. And it was such a gorgeous building. But I get a call one day out of the blue and it's their commercial real estate uh, guy. And he asked me to come down and take a look at the building to give him ideas as to what to do with the building. And, and if they, th- if I would think they could lease it to a restaurant. Mm-hmm. So, so they had a food idea. They had a food idea for half. So this half that we're sitting in now originally was going to be a training center for First Citizens. Mm. And uh, they were going to lease out this, the next door space to some sort of restaurant. They were thinking like a sandwich shop or something like that. And they came and gave me a tour of the building and I took a look at it and was like, I'll think about things. And I was literally parked right out front here. And I remember it was cold and it was raining and I backed out and I just kept looking at the building as I drove off. And I got about halfway around the block and I called him back and I said, are you still there? And he said, yeah. And I pulled around and I luckily got my same parking spot back and I walked in and he goes, do you think of something? I go, yeah, I'll take it. And I mean, I've told this story before, but you know, he said, what are you going to do with it? And I said, and I just kind of looked around. I was like, I'm going to open a whiskey bar and call it bourbon. And it's going to have a Creole Cajun, um, Cajun Creole kitchen. And he's like, is that one of the ideas you've had? And I was like, no, but this building just, you know, you've got the cast iron facade, you've got the, uh, the little, uh, cast iron balcony up there and everything. It all just screams Bourbon Street, you know, New Orleans. Whiskey was a passion of mine. Uh, I've loved small batch bourbons and everything since the 80s when they when Blanton's first came out and Booker's, Baker's, Basil Hayden, and uh, Baker's? No, whatever. There's one other one. Knob Creek. Um, 
that kind of set me down a road of, of bourbon and that I've been on ever since. And so, and I could can kind of feel that the, that tide was rising when it came to bourbon. Sure. And so I was like a whiskey bar, like I would love to have a whiskey bar. So all, a lot of the projects that I've done have been passion projects and completely and utterly selfish in every way. Like I just, it's what I want. Like I don't care what the market says or what the market wants or what the market needs. I think if you don't follow your passion, you're just not gonna have, you're not gonna have success in it. Cause you could open, I could have opened any kind of restaurant. I could have gone, I could have taken what's popular now in America. I could have read any of the latest polls from the Restaurant Association and all that and gone, oh, this is hot now, I'll open that. And it would have failed because I have no passion for it. So along those lines, it sounds like um, you, you talk about passion and concepts, you know, that, that you have these ideas rolling around. Um, I wonder, so you, you think about what, what bourbon is now and then what it was out there on the street in 2013. How close to reality does reality match your vision pretty closely or did it, did yeah. it change? No, it, it matches pretty closely. I mean, you, you know, you have a, your clientele, your customers are definitely going to adjust from there. Like you're gonna have an idea, mm -hmm. but your clientele, the customers that you bring in and what you present at first, they're going to tweak it one way or the other. So, How does that happen? Just it really just happens organically in that uh, you know you you present something to them and immediately it's easy with a restaurant because you know you're you're it would be the same with retail like say you come up with your new collection for the fall okay you put that out there and at the end of the first month or two you know all your teal sweaters are still sitting in a giant pile you know and all of your you know gray tone hoodies have been sold and people are clamoring for more. So it's the same with a, a restaurant and a menu. You'll see right away where the, what your population wants you to be. Okay. So you can stay within 90% of what you wanted from the start, but they're gonna, and you want them to, you know, that's the key is, and then that's, and that's really the fun part is seeing what it is. You know, like sometimes you'll present something and that's, they want that and they want more of it and they want you to just keep doing it. Um, and other times they're gonna kind of self-correct you, you know, they're gonna correct you in in one way or the other. And that's that's a lot of fun to kind of see happen and, and unfold. And it's a very collaborative experience with them because, you know, at the beginning of a restaurant, you're going out and you're asking people at the tables, like, you know, what do you think? Like, be honest. That's the hardest thing. You know, getting customers to be honest with you face to face, mm -hmm. uh, you yeah, they're get, happy to do it on Yelp. For oh, yeah, they can get on Yelp and say all the <laughs> shit in the world. But, you know, honestly, like, if you want real honest feedback, you just sit down with them and get them to, and you'll find those people that'll be brutally honest with you, you know? And some of their advice is great, and some's shit, and, you know, you you know, you know, learn to to separate the wheat from the chaff and, and see, you know, where the, where the real concerns are so you can adjust. Mm -hmm. Is that where sort of this concept, so the lounge opened after the restaurant is, was it was this kind of clientele driven where they said, hey, we want a, we want more of a spot that has a bar and, and less restauranty, I guess? No, no, this, the, the lounge came about because bourbon is so small that on any given night, we'd be on a one to two hour wait. Mm -hmm. So we needed really, we really needed somewhere for people to have cocktails and appetizers um, without losing them. Because if you're on a one and a half hour wait and it's cold, windy, rainy, whatever outside, you're going to wander off somewhere else. And then we'll, you know, 70% of the time, we're probably going to lose you. Yeah. You know, especially if you're hungry. I mean, I, I don't wait anywhere really that much. I mean, if I'm if I'm out traveling, yeah. But if I walk up to a restaurant, even in Colombia, and it's a 45 minute to an hour wait, I, I've got a second place that I'll go, you know, so. But yeah, so this was more out of necessity. Also gave us the access to the courtyard. So, I mean, we more than, you know, we more than doubled our space. We tripled our space available for entertaining people. So that that was nice. Mm -hmm. You know, shifting gears, you know, with being in, in a sort of hospitality business, 
You know, you hear things about, you know, leaders can be taught, you know, they're not born. Um, is that also true in the hospitality business? That, that yeah. That's a skill that can be taught? No. <laughs> <laughs> to a point, yeah. You know, it's the nature-nurture thing. Like, you can, there are, there are leadership skills that you can teach. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm of the opinion that most true leaders are born, uh, or, or I should say they're educated throughout their lives to be leaders, you know, from, you can see it on the playground when you're five years old, you know, uh, some are leaders and some aren't. Uh, so, but there are a lot of leadership and managerial skills that you can teach. There's, there's just an innate quality, I think, to true leaders that um, is, that's a, that's a hard thing. So, yeah. So, but in terms of hospitality, like wanting to really take care of people, make sure that they're comfortable and, and all those kind of things, you know, how do you, when you're sort of building a team, because it seems like restaurants are teams just like almost any other yep. business. Yeah, they are. I mean, what are, what are those things that you're looking for? I mean, you've seen a thousand of these. Yeah. What, what are the things that stand out when you're thinking about building a hospitality team? You know, I've always found in the interview process, you can tell probably within the first minute of any interview. Okay, that's it, fast. Yeah. Well, there's, there's, you know, there's a couple questions that, well, first off, somebody's personality. Like, you know, you're, you, when you deal with somebody and their personality is bright and bubbly and, and, and everything, you, you know, you're starting off with good material. Like, sure. that's what I want to see. Like, I want, I want to know that if you walk in, you've never met me before for an interview and you're bright and bubbly and, and energetic and enthusiastic, that's the way you're probably going to interact with your customers. Mm -hmm. So right off the bat, we're, you know, we're already winning. So from there, I can teach you hospitality. I can teach you how to wait tables. I can, so it's two different things. It's the technical aspect, mm -hmm. like waiting tables is a technical thing. Like that's how to do everything, like when to do everything, your timing and all that. Hospitality is another thing that I think you can teach. Um, you know, you ask people, you know, when it comes to teaching that aspect of you, you, you just literally ask simple questions like, you know, when you go to grandma's house, you know, does she make you feel welcome and everything? You know, is, you know, when you go, do you, do you enjoy that? Well, that's the same thing we do here. It's, you want to make people feel good. Like someone's going to come in after a long day. You don't know what their day was like. They may come in cranky as hell because their blood sugar's low. They had a lousy day at the office, blah, blah, blah. It's not on you. You know, it's not, they're not aiming it at you. They may inadvertently aim it at you when they first sit down, but your job is to make them feel welcome and warm and good about the choice that they made at that moment. And 99% of the time, any of that nastiness that they walk in with melts away immediately because that's all they've been looking for all day long was for someone to say a kind word to them, to do something nice for them, to bring them something, to just kind of assure them that everything's all right. Mm -hmm. You're good. You're safe here. Everything's wonderful. Yeah, they're being served. I mean, yeah. which, is, which is something that, you know, like to your point where they've been going all day or something's happened or they got some news and stuff. And so just sort of that act of service, you know, kind of meeting yeah. them where they are and just, like you said, just taking care of them. And there'll always be, and here's the thing in this business, it's like any business. I, I remember, I don't remember which business guru said this years ago um, in a book, but it was talking about firing your customers. Like if a customer is not a good customer, mm -hmm. feel free to fire them. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I have always held on to and have told other business friends that are coming up in the business, you know, that are coming to me and complaining about, you know, a, a single customer that's just driving them bonkers. And I'm like, get rid of them, you know? you're obviously not a good fit. They can find somebody else to do the same thing you do, but you don't have to deal with them. And that's the case in the restaurant business too. Like I said, some people walk in with a nasty attitude and, that, and that'll continue. Like there's nothing you're gonna do to make them happy. Yeah. And at a certain point, you just have to say, you know what, no charge, just, just go, just leave. Like we can't, whatever's happening to, whatever's happening, we're not, we're not gonna be able to fix this. Like, I don't know what's going on in your life. And, and we've done that before. And I, you know, over the years with all the restaurants that I've had, it doesn't happen often, you know, less than probably once a year. 
But most of the time, those people come back at another time and they're like, you remember that time you basically kind of kicked me out because I was being such an ass? I'm really sorry. Let me tell you real quickly what was going on. And you're like, I completely understand. Like, they're like, I'm just looking to take it out on somebody. And it happened to be you guys. I'm sorry. You know, so I don't know. It's, I just love this business. I really do. You know, just the humanity of it. Just, you know, bringing a meal up to somebody that's, you know, obviously down on their luck. Things like that. Just a little, yeah, I love it. What, what were those early experiences like for you when you were when you were doing that? Because I mean, right now, you know, you're kind of sitting at the top of of an organization. Uh, I won't use the word empire, but I can if you want me to. I never feel like that though. I never. Feel, I always. I I still feel to this day the way I felt when we first opened Mr. Friendly's in '95. I don't feel any different. I don't feel like I'm any different. I've learned more over the years, mm -hmm. but I don't feel any different. I don't feel like I'm on top of an empire. I can sleep a little better at night knowing that making payroll isn't going to be a problem and things like that. Like we're at that point, but my mindset hasn't changed hmm. one iota from what it was like then. I go to bed thinking about, I go to bed thinking about the business and ways we can make it better or things that we need to change or things that I'd like to improve. And I wake up, I mean, I wake up happy and looking forward to the, to the day. Um, and I always have, even when things were just absolute, you know, the darkest, mm -hmm. you know, not enough money in the, in the account to make payroll, not enough money in the account to pay taxes, to pay insurance. I mean, it, I just remember back in the early days, those, you know, it's like being at the beach, you know, oh, the waves are small and they're hitting you, but then like every seventh wave mm -hmm. is just a crusher, you know, and it's not surfing. You're not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're not like, oh, good, a big wave. No, it was like, oh, rent, payroll, taxes, and uh, a lost invoice from the food company all suddenly are due today. Like those were, you know, dark days, but still I woke up every morning, you know, couldn't wait to get to work. So I don't, so, so to get back to the question, like, yeah, I don't, I don't feel any different. Um, and so I don't look at it that way. I don't look at it like now that I'm standing on top of an empire or anything like that. Because let's face it, with COVID, things can change in a heartbeat. Yeah, that was equalizer for sure. Yeah, and it makes you realize, you know, it makes you take everything into, into it, it brings everything back into focus. Like this could all be gone so easily. Mm. So. Well, let's follow that for a second. So, I mean, COVID, I mean, it's kind of the the, one of the elephants in the room, I think we were talking to anyone in food service, but, you know, and without going into sort of what was it like, let's get to the part about the, some of the learnings or even that refocusing, like in what way did it seem to refocus what you're doing? Because you had plenty of experience prior to that. And then that seemed to sort of quote, change everything, if you will. Um, what, what, where did you come out of it at or with? It didn't change much um, as far as our philosophy as to how we do things. We, we just basically had to start over slower. Um, you know, when we were at 50% capacity, I don't know, it feels like, I don't know, it feels like when you're doing 60 miles an hour and then suddenly you hit a 30 mile an hour zone. Like right. you're still driving the same car. Now it's just like, okay, come on. Let's, when can we get back to the speed limit? <laughs> Yeah, it's a little te it was a little tedious, but um, so I don't know. It I don't feel like it, it. It didn't change anything as far as how we operate. Or it just it was just it was a it was a speed bump that that slowed us down. And yeah, I don't I don't ha I didn't I don't think I came away from it with much more than we better be better prepared if anything like this happens again. Like we need to have more money in the bank. We need to have, well, we now have, I mean, we did a really good, I'll say this, we did, I feel like we did a really good job of how we did everything. Like we held a big meeting on March 14th, telling everybody that we'd be closing on March 15th. Um, okay. 
And we were already working on everybody's unemployment stuff. And we managed that for them throughout the entire time we were closed. So they wouldn't necessarily have to call the state very often, they would just call us. And the state did such a phenomenal job with it, I think, um, for our people, you know. So even though it was new to us, I think the way that uh, my partner and my operating manager and I kind of handled it for our employees, I think was was really good. And I think that if it was to, were to happen again, we kind of have a, a, a playbook as to how to do it and and do it as well as we did last time. So that might be the only big thing that came out of it. I, you know, the one of the, th so there were things that had to, that came up that we realized that we don't want to do. So there was, you know, everybody was switching to takeover. I mean, a takeout. And our restaurants have never been really takeout type restaurants. Like I don't feel our food, some of our food probably travels well. I've rarely ever had a good takeout meal. Like, I feel like quality suffers too much. And then when you rely on third party delivery systems to get it to people, then you're running into even bigger problems. So we we did it briefly. We didn't advertise it much and we got rid of it as quickly as we could. Now we may We've just switched over our POS system and we may start picking it back up again, um, but that remains to be seen as to w at what level. It may just be a very limited menu of things that we feel will travel well. But I have spent too many nights at either one of the restaurants with a bag of food sitting there for 45 minutes before a driver came to pick it up. You know, and at that point you're like, I don't even want that. Like, okay, they're here now, but I don't want to send that food out. So now I've got to refire it real quick, make them wait so that the food that does go out is hot and fresh and not been sitting in a bag for 45 minutes because, so. But yeah, because yeah. that customer's thinking, that, well, Black Rooster messed this up. You yeah, know, like, really it's, yeah, like I ordered this like an hour ago and it's just getting here, right. you know, screw Black Rooster. I'm not getting food from them anymore. It's like, that's not us. Like, you know, we were told that they were coming in at 8.15. It was nine o'clock when they finally came to pick it up. Like that's not, so yeah, there were things that we, I won't say we jumped on wholeheartedly, but we tried during COVID and found that it just does not fit us and that's okay. Yeah. So you've you've done restaurants in Forest Acres and Columbia, now West Columbia, you know, sort of the Midlands, if you will, has been your your canvas. Um, what What do great restaurants do for a I mean, are they, why are they necessary? Oh, I think that I feel, I feel good restaurants are as big a part of a community as any of the other cultural arts. Hmm. I feel that they're right up there with, you know, art galleries, museums, uh, playhouses, opera, music venues, all that. I think that is what, I think a rich, a rich cultural uh, scene in a city is what makes a city. Uh, yeah, that's just, that's, I think they're as, as big a part. Like, think about some of the great cities in America. They're easy to think about, they're easy to, it's easy to make a list, and I can guarantee that every one of them has a great restaurant scene. Sure. You know, you don't go to Nashville and expect to eat lousy food, you know? Right. You, you don't go expect to go to Austin and you, know, you just, you know that you're gonna go there and there's gonna be, you're gonna show up, you're gonna sit at a bar at a place that you saw maybe in a magazine or something and you're gonna talk to the bartender and before you walk out of there, you're gonna have a list of 12 places to go that you should eat. So, I, and I feel that's the same with Columbia. When I first moved here, 1993, it wasn't that way. You know, I remember I got here, um, I wasn't gonna look for a job in architecture because it was a recession. I knew nobody was hiring. Wasn't really sure I wanted to go into it anyway. And so I went down to yesterday's and I sat at the bar for lunch and I talked to the bartender and she gave me a list of all the places in town that I should go. And it was like four or five. I mean, it was bad. 
And I went to them and some of them were not, they weren't even that great. Mm. So I was like, oh my God, this is rough. Like this is not coming from Minneapolis, St. Paul to here, you know, Minneapolis, St. Paul, fantastic city, unbelievable restaurant scene, mm -hmm. you know? And I come to Columbia, the capital of South Carolina, after having lived in Charleston too, great restaurant scene. Although back in the day, I will say this, in the early, in the mid eighties, it wasn't that great, mm -hmm. but uh, it was still good for what it was. Cause it was kind of a sleepy little coastal town back then. It wasn't, you know, the number one. Yeah, it wasn't a destination. It wasn't a destination the way it is now. So getting here to Columbia and, and finding that there were maybe four or five restaurants that were considered the best restaurants around, I was like, and then trying them and going, this is not, this is a, this is rough. So, but now, you know, it it's growing and there's still so much room, I feel, for it to grow even more restaurant wise. So yeah, I think it's super important. I think, I, I personally feel, and I'm, I don't know if, how many people agree with me on this, but I personally feel that Columbia is the next up and coming city in the Southeast for food and culture and everything. I mean, when you think about it, like Columbia has got more playhouses and uh, music venues and museums and everything like than Greenville does more than Charleston does. Mm -hmm. The fact that we're a government, university, military city, you know, I think is what, one of the things that has kind of slowed things down a little bit is because people don't really never thought of us as a tourist city because they, that dominates here. But those, all three of those things bring in so many people from around the nation. I mean, when we used to have, when, so, we don't have, Bourbon's not open on Sundays and Mondays anymore. We did away with that coming out of COVID. That's maybe one of the things we learned was that giving the staff a day or two break every week was a, probably a good idea because we were running, yeah, we were burning it on both ends. But on any given Sunday night, the bar would be filled with a whole new set of people who flew into town specifically to do business with the government, the university or the military, you know, staying at a local hotel right downtown. So the addition of these new hotels downtown has been fantastic. You know, I still feel like we're under hoteled for the city. Um, yeah, no, I think, I think all those things are interconnected and they play in really well with one another, but a, a vibrant restaurant scene, I think is key for people coming to see the other things like, We've got a world-class zoo here. Um, we've got, I, I don't know how many Colombians I know who have never taken advantage of our rivers. I mean, I didn't. Yeah. I mean, it was only, I just, I had lived here for 20 years and it was only, you know, yeah, it was, I would lived here for 20 years before I ever floated down the river on a kayak. And the first time I did it, it was like, are you kidding me? Yeah. This is right in the middle of our city? This easy to do? Yeah. Yeah. Columbia, you know, still in my, I'll share an opinion. I mean, just still has too many secrets. Oh yeah. You know, I love that, that. That that we don't, uh, to your point about about the rivers. I mean, some of it's about access. That that has certainly improved. I, I moved here in 99, so mm -hmm. not too long after you. And in, in 99, Main Street was an abomination. The yep. building we're sitting in didn't even exist. No. Nope. Or, or it did exist. It, it did. was maybe an old restaurant, but the first citizens. And they actually, they, and then they closed yep. uh, literally the next year. Yeah, but it was the most embarrassing Main Street in, in yeah. America, in a state capital, no less. Um, right off the steps. It, like literally come yeah. down the steps and, and then you'd veer. Yeah, and uh, but there, there's still too many. I mean, I see that in the business community. I mean, you know, to your point about people coming in, there used to be a conference here every year for um, open source computer programming where the chief technical officer of Google, yeah, Facebook, uh, Netflix, I mean, companies that everyone has heard of and yeah. has in their home on yep. their little screen, those people came to Columbia, yeah. South Carolina every year for about five years. Yeah. Um, they don't come anymore. That's another story. That's probably another episode. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, 
like you said, uh, I think we look at some of these industries or, or government, which is not designed to innovate. We look at the university, which is frankly, in my opinion, very insular and, and sort of self-protective. I would agree. Um, you've got healthcare, which which has a lot of a lot of jobs, but they're all magnets for people coming in from the outside that view our city all the time. Yeah. And I think that some of the, there needs to be sort of a, a, a giant reframe in, in the business community, in government, um, about, and even the university especially, about how you sort of capture and work on all that together. Because we don't, we, we've got the traffic, yeah. but we don't even really recognize it. And we've got these sort of little secrets here yeah. that it's not just that locals know, but locals who've been here for 20 years, like really yeah. local, yeah. are still discovering. And that's kind of a problem. I would say. <laughs> And it has been, yeah. I mean, no. we're about to pull one of these bottles off the shelf. And yeah, I know, like, yeah, exactly, going, but, yeah. Start commiserating it, shot by shot, like, yeah. yeah. No, I agree completely. It's, I've said this since I moved here. Like, in 93, when I moved here, after only a couple of years of living here, that was my biggest complaint about the university, was that, wow, they're their own little fiefdom in the middle of the city. Like, come on, like, let's... Let's reach out and everything, not just through the sports. There's just, there's so much more. Um, I got to know a lot more about the military base here mm. and found that um, their way of interacting with the city was a little bit different because it's a training base. And a lot of those guys, uh, a lot of the people that, that go there can't, just can't. Sure. They don't have the time. And then when they do, it's just, it's, it's sporadic. So you've got a lot of basic training. Um, I believe we have the the Chaplin AIT Center there and everything, you know. But they, for for as many people are, that are out there, uh, the people that are you know stationed here pretty permanently, they you know that's a huge um, part, and they do a really good job. Um, but you know, getting back to the secrets part, so it was funny, you know. So we have a, uh, a food writer that moved here recently, a real good friend of ours. And we were at the Jam Room Music Festival. And she said, like, she never really knew a lot about, she didn't know the secrets about Columbia, mm -hmm. you know. And now that she's living here, she was sitting at the, at the Jam Room Music Festival and she said, I never, like, I maybe never gave uh, Columbia the credit that it deserved. Mm -hmm. She's like, but Greenville could never get away with this. Charleston could never pull this off. Like, it's so cool that you can have a music festival downtown, block off Main Street, and have groups as diverse as punk, heavy metal, jazz rock, all going at the same time, you know. Who else has a market like Emil put together, mm -hmm. you know? Other cities you go to, it's not the same. It's, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of cheap knockoffs or thinking like, oh, you just block a couple of blocks off and throw some tents up. Like yeah, he, yeah, he spoke at length. If, if yeah, if, if your viewers haven't watched Emil's yet, you have to watch that one because, you know, that market started at Gervais and Vine with eight vendors. Mm. Uh, I would cook breakfast and he would manage the his eight vendors out there and then it outgrew that and he moved it over to 701 and now over to all of Main Street. And when I send people there, when they come to town, they're just blown away, yeah. like how great it is. And it's every week, yeah. you know, not not seasonal, like they have to guess when it's gonna be. It's always, it's consistent. There's so many paths, there's so many trails, there's so many, yeah, it's, it, it is, it is, it is a city filled with secrets, but it's, I love it. I, I think that's why, I think that's why it's gonna be one of the next big things that you're going to start seeing written about in all the magazines is, and I'm okay if it doesn't happen quickly. Mm -hmm. I would rather it happen organically. Mm -hmm. if, if there's one thing that I have to say about how Greenville did it, like they had a great PR department. Mm -hmm. Like Greenville suddenly went from nobody knowing about Greenville to every magazine you read was like, Greenville's got this amazing, it's just an amazing place to go and it's got great restaurants and all that. And, We've got friends that live there and they're like, yeah, we have some, but they're hyping it more than what yeah. it actually is. Yeah, and it's like, I would rather not, I would rather not hype Columbia and, and make it something that it isn't. 
So I think it's going to happen naturally and organically. And that's, it's, it's grown since I've been here. I mean, like I said, there used to be like four or five restaurants that were. Yeah, you can sense the velocity is changing and it's been changing over the last couple of years. And, and so it's interesting just as a you know person that lives here, um, you know, you you can you can see that o over time. It's probably taken a lot longer than anybody would have would have wanted, but it seems to you know be be picking up some steam. And I think to your point, you know, having good restaurants and good hospitality um, is part of that because while you have these institutions that are a draw for outsiders to come in, and then you have festivals and other kinds of cultural events that also bring people in, maybe a, a whole different group. Um, the point is to get some of them to stay. Yeah. You know, and, and people want great places to eat. They want yep. great places to live. They, they want to be able to build a life. Yeah. And that's all, it all conspires together to, to do that. Yeah. I, trust me, when, I, when I'm out doing, you know, restaurant chef events around the country and I'm talking to, you know, my peers in the business, I'm, I, all I can talk about is all the good things about Columbia. Because if they start, if I, especially if they start bitching about where they live like man i just don't you know it's too expensive to live here and blah 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 i'm like come to columbia it's like mm -hmm. you know you can get a great house here you get it's a great standard of living it's a great city to be in um come on like yeah. the more the merrier like bring it well that's probably a great place to to put a pin in it i mean we could probably talk for an, easily another hour especially you know about about areas of improvement but but thank you for what you're doing and for what you you've done um you've you've not only made a financial investment in the the city but i mean you you've made an investment of yourself you know i think it it, it comes through in your words it comes through in your work that you know it's not just a financial thing and it, it's a heart thing you know, yeah, definitely. You, you've you've taken out your heart. You've kind of planted it here under the floorboards, and and this is where it's growing. And I, and I don't mean to. That's not flattery. I mean, no. I think it, it comes out, and you know, I hope that people that that view this see that you you can do business that way. Yeah, and live to tell about it. Well, my girlfriend, I think she summed it up best. No, nobody has ever said it like this. She said, she. She's like, his love language is service. Like, that's how he, you know, I never thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. But she was like, he, like, that's how he gives himself to people. That's how he shows his love is by, through service. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that kind of hit me. I was like, maybe you're right. Like, maybe that is like, like I'd much rather just, I don't know, I, I feel more comfortable I joke about it, like way back in the day when I first got into waiting tables, and this is back when like tattoos were just starting to, you know, gain traction again among people other than sailors. <laughs> they said, I said, uh, if I ever get one, it's gonna basically gonna be a hand holding a tray with like a martini on it, and then around it, it instead of like born to ride, it's just gonna say born to serve. Um, because after the military and, and finding out that this business is like my absolute passion, like, that's, I guess you're right. Like that's, it is my, that's my, my, my restaurants are passion projects for myself. Like I said, just completely, utterly selfish. But because of that, it's a passion for me to then present it. Like, you know, it's, it's like, it's like any other artistic endeavor. It's like, you know, you, you, you write a play because you want people to see it and you want people to love it. And that's kind of what the restaurants are. It's like, I write it for my own edification, but I also, if I can't present it, then what's the point? Like, so, I mean, you, you said something at the beginning about, you said, you used the word entrepreneur. And I think that would, that, that term kind of deserves a little bit of, I think I'd like to say something about entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's a it's a buzzword nowadays that a lot of um, a lot of the kids that I'm meeting are like when you when I ask them what they're gonna do and they say I'm gonna be an entrepreneur and I'm like you can't be an entrepreneur hmm. you you I don't like I feel like that word is uh, is misused by them it, it, honestly like if here's a warning to all the the, the people who watch or listen to this like if you're if you're on a dating app and the person's occupation is entrepreneur just run away 
<laughs> because is that code for unemployed? It's exactly what it is. It's like I got a lot of ideas, but I don't have a job. So I think I think entrepreneurship is like is like leadership. It's like it's something it's a thing you do, but it's not something you are like like I I I, I run this company and but part of my job is to lead but I'm not the leader of this company. I was an entrepreneur, I guess, in, in starting and risking everything to, to open the first restaurant and everything. But after I did that, I don't feel like I'm an entrepreneur for opening up the next one unless, you know, I just feel like that's now my job and, and it's something that I do. I have, maybe I have entrepreneurial tendencies, but um, to all the watchers and listeners of this, like, it's not somebody that, it's not what you are. It's a, it, to get to the, to a job, maybe it's a, it's a, it's yeah. a process. It's a verb. It's not really a noun. Yeah. Yeah. You can entrepreneur yourself into a job, but right. you're just not a, like, I just, I've had, and the reason I wanted to bring it up is because I've, I've met so many younger, like in college or college graduates that come in and I'll be behind the bar here and, you know, they go, oh, I always want to meet you. Hey, it's great to meet you. You know, I'm an entrepreneur too. And I'm like, really, what have you done? Well, I've got these ideas for the, I'm just like, yeah, okay, well, back it up there. You know, you you may have entrepreneurial tendencies, but you, you gotta have a job. Yeah. So, and I, and I think that's one of the things like in this business, um, like so many, like I'll meet kids that'll come in and looking for a job, like maybe managers or waiting tables, and they say that they want to open their own restaurant someday. And uh, oh, I don't want to be, a, I don't want ever want to have a corporate place or work for a corporate place. And I think working for a corporate place was one of the best educations I got in this business because they've spent all that money on on coming up with systems to teach you how to do this in the shortest amount of time to get you up to speed and, and working in a, you know, high paced, you know, um, high volume, high dollar uh, location. You, you can't, that's, it's, it's, it's counterproductive to push those things away and say, oh, I, I just want to be, I want to do it like you did it and be an independent. And they don't know that Really, I learned a lot of the same, a lot of the skills that it takes to be an entrepreneur and move on to do my own thing by learning those things from, so. Yeah, I've heard it said, you know, um, maybe this is John Maxwell or someone like that that said, you know, people want to do what you've done without ditting what you did. Yeah. You know? Yeah. They, they see the you behind the, the bar that's yeah. kind of 25 years or 30 years in the making. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, that's. Like there, that's where. You know, how do I? How do I just kind of leap and, and hack yeah. my way to to that? But they don't see the. They don't. I mean, they don't see the hundred and eight hour work weeks. You know, they don't see the the loss of a first marriage. You know, I, I give her credit to this day. The day she told me she was leaving, I literally looked at her and said, "I can't believe you lasted this long," because I was never home. I was, I mean, in order to build the business, it was 7 a.m., prepping, cooking all day, prepping in between, cooking at night, cleaning the kitchen, running the trash out, getting in the car, driving home, sleeping, getting up. I mean, she'd be asleep when I got home, she'd be asleep when I left. That's, that's the did part. That's the doing part. You can, be, you know, you can say you're an entrepreneur all day long, but until you've Till you've put in those hours to make to make a job to create that job yeah well thank you for sharing that um because i think to your point that is a message that you know doesn't doesn't make a lot of the media out there kind of surrounding it and it, and it is sort of the, the other side of the coin you know coins have two sides yeah and i think we only kind of want to focus a lot of times on that shiny side the side that that looks most most appealing the done part not the, yeah not the did part but yeah Thank you for doing this. Thank you Thank for sitting you. down Appreciate with us it. and making yourself available for this place. Of course. Um, if people want to want to find you or find out about your your restaurants, where can they go online or, or I guess social media? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> they're well, on social media. Look they're on social name. media. Yeah. I mean, you know, Bourbon Columbia, Black Rooster SC, The Dragon Room SC. Um, I'm Christian MN. You don't need to follow me. There's nothing to see there. Just 
you know, pictures of my cats and dogs. Um, yeah, we don't have, so we'll have a cohesive, um, we'll probably have a cohesive website that will have all the restaurants on it. But for the time being, I've got them all, each one is a separate website yeah. that I do differently. Cause I'm, 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 ex I'm constantly exploring different uh, technology when it comes to websites and everything. So, but you can find us on all the social medias. They're not hard to find. Great. Thank you so much. Cool. Thank you. Appreciate it.